All right, so this is the second lecture. Um, let me remind you where we left off. So the, the part was to look at this example integral, uh, which is just a propagator with no masses and one, uh, two edges and one loop. And we looked at the convergence domain, we figured out there's three families of poles that repeat in these uh, shifted sequences. And there's a tiny region of convergence and from the formula in terms of gamma functions, we knew that this thing was actually a meromorphic function. And now the question is whether this is a fluke of this simple one loop integral or this is actually more general. So, so this is the, the goal. So questions. Um, uh, given any Feynman integral Um, number one, um, so what is, is its domain of convergence? And the second question was um, like, what do its poles look like? Or more generally, what is its analytic continuation? So the integral only converges in a small region, but uh, we want to make sense of the integral everywhere. And the question is, how do you do this? I mean, first of all, is it possible and, and more concretely in practice, how to get actually expressions, meaningful expressions um, for the residues uh, or the Laurent expansion. And well, a very broad, broad brush a statement would be that the, the first is uh, solved by some generalization of power counting. And the second is uh, closely related to integration by parts. And I'll try to sketch how, how this works and then state the, the main results and show some examples um, so, um, okay. By the way, if there's any questions or anything, I, I can't follow the chat while I'm doing this. So please just uh, unmute and just shout and then we can discuss it. Um, okay, so let me uh, do a toy example of analytic continuation. So let's look at the gamma function again x to the n minus one, e to the minus x dx. Now actually, what about this integral? Where, where does this convert? So by power counting, uh, the, the, the problem comes when x gets small. Um, so by just looking at this, uh, you can see that actually this integral converges only for real part of n bigger than, than zero. So if, if you just had this integral e expression like you have for a Feynman integral, you only know it converges in some, some domain, but the, we want to understand how does it extend beyond this domain of convergence. So as I already said, what, what we got to do is integration by parts. Parts. Okay, so let's integrate by parts here. Uh, then, so I'm integrating the x to the n minus one. So that integrates to x n over n. And then I have the e to the minus x. So the boundary terms. And then I also have a term where I still have to integrate the x to the n, but I have a de derivative now acting on the e to the minus x. So this is just a single integration by parts. Now this boundary term is zero, right? If uh, for x large, the exponential suppresses it. And for x small, if the real part of n is positive, then it leads to zero. So at least in the domain of convergence, this boundary term is zero. So we get this identity. So we get a different integral representation of the same function. And actually we can do this many times. So let's do it uh, k plus one times. <clears throat> 
then uh, you get uh, a prefactor which is n times n plus one and so on times n plus k in the denominator times an integral x to the n plus k. And now we have k plus one derivatives acting on e to the minus x dx. I mean, I am aware that actually this derivative, right, leaves e to the minus x invariant. So actually this is just e to the minus x and you get the functional equation for the gamma function. But the point is we don't want to use this because in general for a Feynman integral, this would not be the case. So, but even without recognizing this, this fact, you learn something from this rewriting from this integration by parts. Because this, this thing here now, right, for small x, you now have this big power, this, which is k steps bigger than it was originally. So this integral converges in a bigger domain. So now this thing is holomorphic and convergent um, for the entire domain where the real part of n is bigger than minus k minus one. So for every integration by parts you apply, you increase the domain of convergence by, by a step of one into the left uh, half plane in N. And then here you have poles. At zero, minus one, minus two, and so on. So what you learn from this is that this gamma function extends into the entire complex plane because wherever you are on the complex plane, if you do enough integration by parts, you get an integral representation that still computes the same function is, and, it, and it is an analytic continuation. So if you stay away from the poles, this is a holomorphic function. And since analytic continuation is unique, uh, there is no other way to do it. Um, so the corollary of this is that uh, the gamma function extends um, to a unique meromorphic um, function on C. So you can take uh, N, the argument to be in the complex numbers anywhere uh, with simple poles. Um, at the uh, non-negative integers. I mean, this is literally a proof of this, this corollary, what I've shown you. Um, so if you don't know what the behavior of the gamma function is, now you know it, it has poles at zero, minus one, minus two, and so on. All the poles are simple, right? There's no higher order poles. Every pole only comes once. Um, so, so that's that. Um, and and the, the point is that the, the same is true for an arbitrary Feynman integral, essentially. So you want to generalize this um, to Feynman integrals. Uh, so what we have to do is we have a different integrand and we will have several variables instead of one. These are the main differences. Generalize um, to several variables. and different integrand. Now, when you think about it, I already did not use any information about the integrand e to the minus x, right? I mean, this, this integration by part that I did here would have worked for any f, for any function instead of e to the minus x. So actually this generalization we already have done. Um, so let me just write this out. Um, so, um, so note, um, so in general, if you have this integral x to the n minus one of some function dx, I mean, I am assuming something. I am assuming that these boundary terms vanish, right? So I am using that the function x, f of x for large x falls off sufficiently fast, but this is always the case for Feynman integrals. Uh, so actually we can just use the same formula uh, and replace this by any of the integrands we're interested in. 
So we increase the, the exponent and we take a bunch of derivatives. And, the, and this implies actually, you think about it. Well, what happens now when you send n to an integer, to a negative integer, right? I mean, then you get a pole, okay. You get a pole from the prefactor, but what is the residue, right? So when you take the residue at n equals minus k, so for, now this is for an integer. So I assume k is a, a non-negative integer. And I'm looking at the residue at minus this integer. Um, so what is the residue of this integral? Or rather the, the residue of the analytic continuation of this integral, right? Well, you have it here. Uh, so at the residue, this, this is the factor that goes away by taking the residue. The other ones will just give you a factorial. And now in the integrand, uh, this n plus k is zero, right? So you just integrate a derivative of f. But of course, that's easy to do. It just means you, you do one integral by losing one of the derivatives. So if you work it out, what this means is that the residue is just the kth derivative at x equals zero of f to the x, right? So one observation here is that the residues of these functions have an integration less. So in particular, in this case, there's no integral anymore. So you can read off the residues um, by expansion of the function around a certain point, in this case around zero. So the coefficients of the integrand at zero give you the residues uh, of, the, of the integral. And this is actually pretty useful for Feynman integrals. I think I put a question for this on the, on the exercise sheet. Um, because this, this means it reduces integrals uh, with numerators. In momenta. So what I mean is I started with Feynman integrals which only have these quadrat quadrics in the denominator. Now if you want to have a Feynman integral where you have some say some li dot lj in the numerator, right? Then what you can do is you can just view this as a, as a quadric in itself with an exponent n that is negative. And by this formula it tells you actually this, this integration over this new Schwinger parameter for this numerator actually generates and you can get rid of it uh, by just taking some derivatives and then you set the variable to zero so essentially all these integrals, these numerators can be expressed in terms of integrals that don't have numerators. So this is also a standard step used in amplitude calculations when you compute prime integrals, you first write them down in the basis with uh, numerators. And then if you want, you can get rid of the numerators and write everything just in terms of um, integral families where the quadrics are the inverse propagators. Okay, so that's good. Now we want to generalize this to several variables. Uh, okay, so let's define something. Um, the, the power counting, power counting degree. I don't think that's a universally agreed uh, terminology, but anyway, so the, the power counting degree of, of f of x is something, if you have several variables, this depends on the direction. So you have to say in which direction you want to power count. So let's say we want to power count in the direction. Um, well, the direction is given by some vector in R to the n. Um, and it's defined to be the exponent Uh, such that for uh, the scaling of the variables, uh, you have the following. So you have your f of x and you, you scale all of these variables by a certain power of a parameter rho say. So rho is just a bookkeeping device. What matters are these exponents sigma. 
So let's say I scale the first variable by rho to the sigma one and the last variable by rho to the sigma n and, and so on in between. Then you look at what happens when rho goes to zero and you look at the leading term. So when rho goes to zero, there will be a certain power of rho that, that factors out. And I, and I call this exponent of this power, I call this the degree. Um, so there will be a certain power with which the, the integrand uh, becomes small or big, depending on whether omega is negative or positive. Um, and then all the correction terms are, are suppressed in this limit. So this is what I want to call the, the power counting degree. Um, and maybe given, let me give an example. Um, uh, so let's take the, the integrand of our favorite integral. Um, so this is just the, the measure from the Schwinger parameters. And now actually I'm writing it um, in the uh, Lee Pomeranzky representation where we have just a single polynomial. So this is U and this is F. Um, so this is the integrand of the Lee Pomeranzky representation just so that you can see this one in action as well. And now what happens under the scaling? Well, what happens to this term, right? Essentially this is X one to the power N one. And if X gets scaled by rho to the Sigma one, then this gives a factor rho to the n1 times sigma one. This goes like rho to the n2 times sigma two. And now here it gets a bit more complicated because you have different terms, right? So the x1 goes like rho to the uh, sigma one. This goes like rho to the sigma two. And the product goes like rho to the sigma one plus sigma two. So now, the question which one is the dominating one in the limit rho goes to zero that actually depends on what these sigmas are. You cannot really say this without um, knowing more about sigma. So all you can say is, okay, this omega of sigma is, well, I mean, obviously this, this multiplies, right? So in the exponent, you have the n1 times sigma one, you have the n2 times sigma two, and then there's a minus d over two, but then which one is the, the one that dominates for a small rho? Um, well, that depends. So it's the minimum of the exponents here. Sigma one, sigma two, sigma one plus sigma two. Okay, so this is the power counting function. Depends on the direction. And let me try to sketch how this looks. Um, how do I do this? Okay. Uh, so let me try to draw a diagram. So on the horizontal axis, I write the exponent of X1. On the vertical axis, I write the exponent of X2. Then in this uh, polynomial here, we have only three monomials, right? We have x1, which has exponent of x1 being one and the exponent of x2 being zero. Then we have x2. So let me maybe write this. So this, this point here is the monomial x1. This is x2. And then we also have x1 times x2, right? So this is exponents one for both variables. So this is x1 times x2. Okay, now what does this, this power counting degree look like? Or, or rather mostly this minimum, right? Because this term here always stays the same. So we're interested in, in when this minimum changes. So let's suppose uh, I take a direction uh, like this, right? So, so let's suppose this is this sigma here, this is my direction. Then I wanna look at the monomial such that the, the product with this direction is the minimum, right? So I can also write this, this sigma one here, right? This is the product of sigma with one zero. This is the product of sigma with zero one. And this is the product of sigma with one one. 
right? So in order to figure out what the minimum or normal is, you, you choose a direction and then you come in this direction and you stop when you hit the first monomial in your polynomial. So this would be, this would be the dominating monomial for a small row if this is your scaling direction. Okay, now let's change this direction a little bit. So let's choose this direction. Then we come from this side and still, it would still be that at this point we would stop and hit this, this vertex. But if you if keep turning further, then if, if you come from, from here, then suddenly we hit this x1, x2 vertex first, right? So once we say have rotated sigma further so that it points a bit down, um, then this is now the dominating monomial, okay? So what I want to illustrate is that somehow all this depends on is, is this triangle here, this polygon, right? So what you're doing is for every sigma, for every direction, you, you, you look at what is the first, when do you first hit this, this polygon, this blue thing? And that tells you what, uh, what the leading monomial is, what the minimum is. Now in this entire region here, when I'm in, in, in these kind of angles, it's always this X1 that I hit. So actually this minimum will always be the, the Sigma one. So it turns out that this function, this Omega function is, is locally like a linear function. And then at some point it swaps and becomes a different function when a different monomial hits. So let me just try to illustrate this. Um, so now let me draw a different diagram where I wanna draw Omega. So omega depends on sigma one and sigma two. Um, and actually I'm, I'm only drawing the, the minimum function here. Yeah, because this is the, the tricky part. And then it turns out that the minimum changes only in certain directions, right? So as I said, when we come in this direction, we hit this vertex first, we rotate, we still hit this vertex first. Then suddenly when we, are, uh, when we have this direction, the horizontal direction to the left, then somehow both monomials are hit at the same time. And then from then on, if you turn further, this X1, X2 dominates. So somehow this direction, this that points inwards here, this is the direction where, where it switches. In, the, in this angle, one monomial switches to the other uh, to become dominant. And the same happens at these other three. So basically you take the, the orthogonal vectors standing on the sides of this polygon, and this is when the power counting changes. So in this diagram here, we have a, a boundary where something changes. It goes to the left. So this is the multiples of uh, minus one zero, the vector pointing to the left. Then you have the vector pointing down. Um, and you have this diagonal Okay, so, so this is the normal vector from, from the left side of the, the triangle. And now in between, the, the thing stays constant. So, so maybe let's look first at this region down here. I'm not sure if you can see this, but the, the shaded region in the bottom right, in this region, the minimum is sigma two. Yeah. So if you take a vector in this region, like the one that points down, right, we hit first um, this vertex here, the, the vertex X2. So the Sigma two is the minimum. Similarly, uh, in the other region, uh, this region here, um, then the minimum is given by Sigma one. And then finally you have this region down here where the minimum is sigma one plus sigma two. Okay. So this, this is a kind of separation right into different sectors. You could call these sectors. Indeed, there's something called sector decomposition that, that uses these different scalings um, to decompose a Feynman integral and to rewrite the integral representation to make it convergent. Um, so this is used, um, uh, for that, and it, it has a name. So I'll, let me just put this here. This is called the normal fan. 
Yeah, so the, 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 these regions together with these separating rays, they call something that's called a fan. And it's called the normal fan because these regions where something happens, where, where you swap from one sector to another sector, as I explained, these directions are exactly the directions that are orthogonal to this polytope here. So with this in place, uh, we can finally state uh, the general uh, results for, these, for the analytic continuation of these integrals. Um, so let me just int so let me just make one note from this picture uh, note the power counting function uh, switches um, precisely. along these normal directions. So more correctly, it's the inward, inward pointing uh, normal directions. Um, to what's called the Newton polytope. So what is the Newton polytope? The Newton polytope is this triangle on the left here. So this thing that's spanned by the, the coordinates of the monomials that show up in the, in the integral representation. This is the Newton polynomial, NP. And in general, how is it defined? In general, you have NP is the convex hull um, of all the vertices of the non-vanishing coefficients. So what do I mean by this notation? So we have this u plus f in the integral representation and this is a polynomial. So we can write it as some linear combination of monomials. So let me denote by v the exponents. So then we have some coefficient and some monomial. So this stands for x1 to the v1 to xn to the vn. Right, and all the non-vanishing coefficients, so all the monomials that actually show up, like x1, x2, x1 times x2. Right, I take all of these, these uh, exponents of these as vectors, as I did in this picture, and then I get these three points, and then the convex hull is this triangle that they span. Okay, so this is just a formalization of of what we've seen in the picture, and then the theorem is. Uh, so theorem following our equivalent uh, number one this integral x to the n minus one dx times our u plus f minus d over two, i.e. a Feynman integral. If you take uh, polynomials u and f that come from a Feynman integral family, uh, this thing converges. So that's equivalent to having the real part of these uh, power counting degrees positive for all directions, uh, for all directions, sigma, except of course for the zero direction. So this is what you would naively expect. This is a naive generalization of the power counting, right? You have several variables, so you can look at these scalings in all kinds of directions. And if it's positive in every direction, then the integral converges. The problem is only that this is a bit difficult to check because you have infinitely many directions in which you can power count. So this is why this little geometric insight that we did earlier is important. So if, if you think a bit uh, about what this means is an equivalent formulation is that the real part of N is in the interior um, of the D over two times uh, the Newton polytope. 
So you scale a Newton polytope uh, by d over two, and then everything in the interior is a convergent uh, value. And uh, there is a fourth equivalent uh, characterization. And that's maybe the most useful. Uh, number four is again, you check the, the power counting degree to be positive, but not for every vector, only for all um, inward normal directions. And the point is that there's only five. You have this polytope, it has finitely many normal directions. Uh, so this is something you can actually check. Okay. So just to, to remind you how that actually seen this before. So you've seen a triangle before. Maybe you recall, oh, I can go back here. So this is a page from the previous lecture where I've drawn the, the singularities of this bubble integral. And we saw we have these three families of singularities that, that were translations. And there was this little domain of convergence, which was this uh, triangle um, between the vertices D over two um, uh, in these points and then twice there, D there. Uh, so actually it is no coincidence that this triangle of, of the convergence domain is uh, the same triangle up to the scaling by D over two uh, that you see here, right? So what I've done here is I've looked at the polynomial and I've written down the monomials that show up in this polynomial, x1, x2, x1, x2. And the point is that this is exactly the same triangle. So this is what this, uh, this point three says here. Now you can always draw this. You look at the uh, polynomial u plus f, you take all the monomials, they span a polytope. And then if you multiply it with a dimension over two, you can read of what the convergent ends are. Uh, and this is always the case. So I, I hope that this illustrated this a little bit. Now, okay, let me just make one, one example here. So again, for this one, right? Uh, we've seen it earlier, but just to, to illustrate this, this again, so um, convergent in D equals four. So if you want to have a convergent integral in four dimensions, right? So now the convergence domain, this is the diagram in N1 and N2. And remember it goes from D over two. So D over two is two now in four dimensions. So it's this triangle, right? And I draw all the lattice points. Um, every choice of N in here is convergent, um, but sadly there is no point in here, right? I mean, there are some points on the boundary, but we have to be inside. So actually in four dimensions, there's no convergent integral. So there's no convergent integral with integer indices. But if you go to, to 10 dimensions, but all that happens is that this thing gets scaled, right? So in, in six dimensions, D over two is three. So you go one, two, three. Um, so now you have a lot more integer points to play with. Um, and what is the domain of convergence? Well, it's again, this triangle, but now it's a triangle uh, that goes from three to three. So this is the convergence region. And actually now there is a point that sits inside. So that's a convergent point. So the, the integral in six dimensions uh, with both indices equal to two. So this is convergent. 
Okay. So, so one thing you, you, you realize by looking at this, for example, is that uh, um, in, in large dimensions, Uh, there are lots of convergent intervals. And uh, in particular, this means there exists bases of finite integrals. So then you want to compute the epsilon expansion of an integral. Uh, the integral representation, they can be singular in general, they will have singularities, but you can always uh, rewrite it in terms of integrals that actually are convergent. And once they are convergent, you can compute the epsilon expansion by expanding under the integral sign. So again, I, I hope to, to put an exercise for that on the, on the exercise sheet, but this is like the general idea how one might convince oneself of the fact that this is true. Okay, so we've explained where the singularities are, but there was one more statement, right? There was a statement about the analytic continuation and what the poles are. So if I go back to, to this picture, right? So I have explained now in full generality that we always have some polytope uh, of convergence and it is bounded by some, some hyperplanes that are orthogonal to these normals. Uh, but there's another feature here, right? Here we saw we have an analytic continuation and that these hyperplanes repeat and that we have simple poles on these hyperplanes. And this is also true for arbitrary time intervals. So maybe let me put this uh, here. So this is maybe theorem two. So this, these integrals D and Z have a unique uh, mirror morphic analytic continuation. Um, and this continuation has simple poles um, at the hyperplanes. So the first statement is there is, they have a unique biromorphic continuation. The second statement is it only has simple poles the third statement is that these poles only appear on linear hyperplanes. In general, a function could have poles on some curved subspaces, but they are only on linear hyperplanes. And those are exactly the hyperplanes of the form where a scaling degree um, becomes zero or minus one or minus two um, for the normals. Sigma of the Newton polytope. So this is just a straightforward generalization of what we saw in the example and actually it works always. So once you understand these, these polytopes and these, this power counting, then you know exactly where the poles are. And actually you can compute the residues as I, as I explained earlier, uh, you do these integrations by parts and you can write down formulas for the residues in terms of simpler integrals and maybe I'll close by uh, explaining this in some examples. So this is about residue factorization and power count. So let me do a special case. Special case of a divergence. This is an ultraviolet. So what are the ultraviolet divergences? These are called UV. And I also, I will specialize two graphs. So as I explained earlier, you can always get rid of numerators. So for, in the end, you can always boil down the power counting if you want to. You can reduce it to, to graphs, um, time integrals without numerators. So where every of these quadratic forms is of this form mass squared minus momentum squared. So if you're in such a situation, um, you can write down formulas for, for some of these degrees of divergence. So let's take a subgraph. Uh, 
So you take some of the edges. Um, so I call this subset of the edges here a subgraph. And now if we scale just the edges in the subgraph all with the same unit scaling. So we send xe to xe times rho um, for all edges in the subgraph, right? So this means um, in our previous notation that we're looking at the scaling direction sigma where we have uh, only two types of indices. Every power scaling is either zero or one. And the ones where we have one, those are the edges in the subgraph. And all the edges not in the subgraph, they don't get scaled. So this is a very special scaling that we only have two types of coordinates. Now, if you have such a scaling, then first statement is um, the U polynomial of the graph. So now I just write the subscript to indicate this is the U polynomial of the original big graph. So under the scaling, the leading order of row that comes out is the loop number of gamma. And this is the first statement that the power of row is the loop number. The second statement is the leading coefficient in this limit factorizes into the U polynomials of the subgraph and the graph that's called a quotient graph that you get by contracting the subgraph to a single vertex. I'll give an example of this. Uh, in a second. And then you have higher orders, of course. But to leading order in this scaling limit, um, you get this product of two graphs. And a similar thing happens for, for the second polynomial, Fg. So again, the, the leading power of rho is the loop number of the subgraph. You get the u polynomial of the subgraph, and now the f polynomial of the quotient graph. So again, it, it factorizes. Um, so this is actually also a nice exercise. So if you use the description in terms of spanning trees that I gave in the last lecture, it's actually a pretty straightforward combinatorial exercise to prove these factorizations and this power behavior. So you're invited to, to convince yourself of that if you want. It's not, not that difficult. Um, but what do we learn from this, right? So this is the leading order, right? And so this means that u plus f also goes to this order. Um, so we conclude that uh, conclude that um, the omega, uh, the scaling in this direction is given by, well, remember we always had the, the product of the n's and the sigmas coming from the integration measure. Now in this case, um, the sigmas for the subgraph variables are all one. So we just get the sum of the n's in the subgraph. And then we get minus d over two times the omega times the scaling of, of the uh, u plus f polynomial, but this is given by the loop number as these equations show, right? So actually this is nothing but the, the superficial degree of convergence that I defined at the very beginning of the subgraph, right? So if you would view the subgraph as a graph in itself, then this is just the sum of all of its indices minus d half times the number of its loops. So this is the power counting for an ultraviolet subdivergence. Um, but there is a second statement that you need. Um, so this is lemma two, this is for infrared divergences. So now suppose that um, that um, the subgraph contains all massive edges and that the subgraph connects all external momenta, all external legs of the graph. So if you think a bit about this, then this implies that the quotient graph has vanishing polynomial, right? Essentially because the quotient graph doesn't have any massive edges because the massive edges have all been contracted 
And also in the quotient graph, every external leg is at the same vertex. So by momentum conservation, the external momentum is zero. So this quotient graph has no momenta and no masses. So this F polynomial has to be zero. So what this means is that in this case, this equation actually doesn't tell you anything because this factor is zero. So actually the loop number is not really the, the proper leading power because actually it vanishes to one order higher. So the question is what happens then? Um, so then you have a different factorization formula. Then you have um, that uh, the F polynomial goes like the loop number of the subgraph plus one. And now that the orders are reversed. So now you get the U polynomial of the quotient graph and the F polynomial of the subgraph. Um, okay. So this makes sense, right? Because every, the, the subgraph has all the external legs. So it really makes sense to consider a subgraph as on its own with the external data of the bigger graph. And the quotient graph doesn't have any kinematics. So you can only describe this U polynomial. Okay. And if you think of, a bit what this means for the power counter degree, then you conclude that omega of minus sigma in this case um, is minus omega of the quotient graph. Yeah, so this is, uh, I mean, we are assuming here that, uh, that this thing is non-zero, right? If, if this, F vanishes again, then you have vanishing to even higher order, right? And then things get messed up even further. Um, but let's assume that this is non-zero, then you have this power counting. And I should say that these are called the infrared divergences or soft. Problem is there's many different types of infrared divergences and this would be a, called a soft divergence. Um, now, so these are special uh, types of power countings, right? And they all have to be positive for, to get a convergent integral. The question is whether this is enough, whether these conditions are sufficient. And there, there, is, there is a theorem of this type for special situations. So I'll state the theorem and then give some examples to close. Um, so suppose that a graph um, has generic momenta So this is to exclude this possibility that uh, um, you can, could have this vanishing without having all the massive edges and legs connected or that this thing might even be zero. So, so what is this condition? So we want that uh, if you cut the graph in two, if you do a minimal cut, uh, then you don't want the momentum through the cut to be the sum of the cut masses. Uh, so the picture here you should have in mind is uh, you have your graph and it, you cut it into two pieces. Right? There can be external legs uh, in these two pieces. And there's some edges in between. And these are the edges you cut, right? So you cut your graph into two pieces then there is a momentum flowing through similar like the momentum flowing flowing through a two forest and the definition of the F polynomial. So this is on the left. Um, and then on the right, you have the sum of the masses that you cut. The problem is when, when this is equal, uh, it may mean that you're on some kinematic singularity on some threshold. And then some of these uh, power countings get messed up. Um, but one way, for example, to guarantee this. Uh, so for example, this, this holds for Euclidean momenta. If you have Euclidean external momenta, this is fulfilled. Um, because for Euclidean in my convention with my metric, right, it means that the left-hand side is negative. And if the masses are positive, they, the left and right-hand side can never be equal, right? So these degenerations is really a Minkowski phenomenon. If you have Feynman integrals that have a Euclidean region, 
then you're fine. Then you don't have to worry about this problem. So this is assumption. Suppose we are in this situation. Um, then, then the UV and IR divergences from above um, those are all divergences. So you really, in this situation, it means you only have to do the simple power counting, right? Where you just count, um, you just look at all the subgraphs and for each subgraph, um, you just check whether it's UV or IR and then you count. So this means only need to check uh, subgraphs. In general, these, these regions can be more complicated as I, as I hinted. Right? So the special thing is that here, we're only looking at, at simultaneous scalings of the same speed. So all the variables are either staying the same or they go with, with the power row to the one to zero. But in general, you could have situations where some variables go quicker to zero than others. And then the sector decomposition becomes more complicated. And, uh, and I will put an example on the exercise sheet, but in, in the case here, this, is, this cannot happen. And indeed, you know that this is everything. So let me just close with, uh, with some examples. So for these examples, let's consider all the indices to be equal to one. And let's work in four minus two epsilon dimensions. All right, so if, uh, if you take, for example, the graph, following graph. Um, so what does this graph look like? Uh, Okay, so I take a graph with one momentum going in and out again. Um, then, well, that's that's a graph. What is what is the, the overall degree of convergence? Well, if all the ends are one, this thing has eight edges, so we get eight from the sum of edges. It has four loops. Half the dimension is two minus epsilon, so this is four epsilon. So you would say this graph has an overall overall logarithmic um, ultraviolet divergence. Okay. And now if you look at all the subgraphs, actually everything's fine, except for the subgraph given by these six edges here. So if you look at this subgraph, if this is gamma, then you find that omega of the subgraph, well, this subgraph only has six edges, and three loops. So this is three epsilon. So also when you put epsilon to zero in four dimensions, this thing would be zero. So it would not be positive. So indeed this is another singularity of the integral. So we have a, a logarithmic uh, subdivergence. Okay. Uh, ultraviolet again in this case. And then one thing to, to note that follows from the, the factorizations I mentioned earlier. Um, so what now if you want to compute this, this, this pole there? Well, you know that the, uh, the residue at uh, omega of the subgraph being zero of the integral, because of this factorization, it factorizes into what I call P gamma times I of the quotient. And this P gamma, this is uh, by definition, this is the integral. I mean, P gamma itself is the residue at omega uh, equals zero of the integral. Right, so if you think about what that means in the parametric representation, right? This is the product of all the edges, all the integrals. Um, now the gamma function has disappeared because I took the residue um, and you have your delta and you just have the U polynomial, right? So remember the projective representation 
the f polynomial comes with an omega in the exponent. So then you take the omega at the overall divergence, and then take the residue at the overall divergence, the f polynomial disappears, and you get this thing. And now when you compute the residue of a UV subgraph, then remember from the subgraph, you only get the U polynomial. So this is why you only get this kinematics independent part. This is called the period. And then from the quotient, you still have the F polynomial. Um, so this is what you get here. So in this case, this would be um, the period of this, this graph times the integral of the quotient graph and the quotient graph in this case is this bubble. Um, okay. And that bubble has itself a pole. Yeah, because it has an overall divergence. Um, and, but you know what its residue is, right? It's the period of this bubble. So what this means is that uh, the double pole, um, so this, this integral of this graph, um, right, in near four dimensions, this has two poles. There's a one over four epsi uh, three epsilon from the subdivergence, and there's a one over four epsilon from the overall divergence. Um, and what are the residues? What are the coefficients? Well, there are these, they are these period things of the subgraph and the quotient graph. And then, of course, you have higher orders. So that there would also be first order poles and higher order terms. Yeah, but what this factorization tells is that you can relate the higher order poles to these products of integrals of sub and quotient graphs. So actually, if you, if you care about it, this is actually one and this is six zeta of three. So these real integrals are very well understood. Um, so in this case, it tells you how you can predict the, the second order pole in terms of the sub and quotient graphs. Okay, I'm already running over time. I'm just doing one more example uh, and then I'm stopping. So for the infrared, so let's do infrared example. Um, so, uh, okay, let's look at this graph. It's called the Mercedes graph. So here uh, again, I want to set uh, the, the indices to one that I mentioned close to four minus two epsilon. And also in this case, I want to set the masses to zero. Okay. So this, this double pole it doesn't depend on the masses. It's always this. At the higher order terms, they depend on the masses. Um, but anyway, so for this infrared example, I want to assume the masses to be zero. Now, if you look at this graph, and let's first compute the, the, the power counting degree overall, where well, this thing has eight edges and three loops. So this is uh, two plus three epsilon. So actually this thing is overall, is, it's actually convergent, right? Overall it's quadratically convergent. This is how you would call something that has a two here as a convergent power counting degree. And now you can look at all the subgraphs and it turns out that all the subgraphs are fine except for one. So there's one subgraph that is nasty, which is this one. So if you take the bottom two edges, um, right? So it's this subgraph. So this is infrared because it, first of all, there's no masses, right? So obviously it includes all the massive edges because there are no massive edges, but it also connects the two uh, external, uh, external legs. So you can route the momentum through these two propagators. So it's an infrared type subgraph. And so what is now the, the condition, right? The condition was that minus omega of the quotient had to be positive. So what is minus omega of the quotient? So that's minus omega of, well, now if you contract these two edges and you shrink them to a point, this again becomes this graph that I have drawn a couple of times now. Uh, and we computed what, what, what that uh, degree of convergence is. So this is minus three epsilon. So again, when epsilon is zero, this thing is 
zero, so it indicates a, a subdivert. So this is a logarithmic uh, soft uh, infrared subdivergence. And this is the only divergence in this case. So just, just as a side remark, right, this means that uh, um, converges, the integral converges for a small epsilon less than zero, right? The conditions is that this power count always has to be positive. So we have to have epsilon less than zero. Whereas previously in the ultraviolet case, um, right, if you look at this and this, the conditions are convergence for small epsilon bigger than, than zero, um, just as a side remark. And, and again, you have this factorization, so you can do this integration by parts, uh, as I explained um, for, for the gamma function, right? And that means that you can express the residues uh, in terms of the of the sub and quotient graphs with the factorization. So in this case, what does it mean? Um, the residue at uh, at the uh, when this quotient graph is infrared singularity, right? Which is the vanishing of the omega of the quotient graph. So if you take this residue of the Mercedes graph. Um, then now this is an infrared subgraph. So in this case, right, you get the second, the F polynomial from the subgraph and the U polynomial from the quotient. So in this case, you get this period function, the residue of the quotient graph times the Feynman integral of the subgraph. Now the subgraph is pretty simple because it's just two edges, right? It's, it's a tree Feynman graph. So there's no integral to do. You can do the write down what this Feynman integral is very easily in, in momentum space, right? So this is just one over P squared squared. And I already told you that this is six times zeta of three. So this tells you that uh, in the epsilon expansion of this Mercedes integral, Right, you have uh, uh, you have this coefficient six zeta of three. Uh, you have the uh, minus three or minus three epsilon, and then you have one over p to the fourth. And then, of course, you have higher orders. Okay. So, just to, to sum up, so what we've seen is there are these. Uh, th there's this power counting business. And if the graph is nice enough, it's, it's sufficient to look at subgraphs and distinguish whether they're infrared or ultraviolet. And furthermore, there is this analytic continuation business, which allows you to derive uh, integral equations, uh, integral expressions that are actually convergent. And in particular for the residue, it gives you these formulas, but remember we had uh, a general formula also for higher orders uh, of the expansion. I think, again, there will be an example on the exercise sheet. Um, and then we observe these factorizations. So I think that's all I wanted to uh, mention in this lecture. Then in the next lecture, I will talk about uh, the dependence on kinematics uh, a bit in Landau analysis and monodromy. All right, that's, that's it for now. Thank you. Maybe I can turn the camera around again. Uh, where is this? Yes. Can you see me? Okay. Hello everyone watching the lectures. So thanks a lot for the lecture. <laughs>